Hey, greetings everyone. Welcome back. It's GleeCon, and I am happy, stoked to be with you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, on our last episode, we looked at Hills, Brad Foothills from the Alliance perspective again, this time with a little bit more uh, appropriately leveled character, uh, Shalasir, our feral night elf druid, and uh, she killed Murlocs, and she killed some Naga. We've also been, we also got killed by, by Onyxia's guards in Stormwind while I was just spectating, just got cleaved and one-shotted. Um, we have also been reading the War of the Scaleborn, and things got good in the last chapter where they finally caught that traitorous black dragon. They also, um, cats out of the bag to some extent that the Drakthir exist, and, um, they also now have proof that Razageth is the one, uh, behind all the attacks. So they, really, both sides have plenty of evidence, need, and the primals know that Tyr is dead. So there's plenty of evidence on both sides for them to be ready to start the war. So stay a while and listen, and let's see if that happens in this chapter 11 of War of the Scaleborn. Um, yeah, okay. Messengers from the Black Dragon Flight arrived at the Ruby Life Pools at dawn, carrying terrible news. Terasek villages had burned in the Reach. Three Black Dragons lost their lives in the skirmish that followed, but the main perpetrator, Razageth, had escaped. Settlements had burned outside the Broodlands for decades, but this was the first time that villages within the Broodlands had been targeted. To inflict such pain so close to ordered holdings was bold, and clearly it was a risk that hadn't benefited the perpetrators. The sun had barely opened a glittering eye on the horizon, but despite the early hour, Alexstrasza called an emergency meeting. Those Dormu, Malagos, and Neltharion came at speed, gathering at the seat of the Aspects. Isera remained behind in the Emerald Gardens, overseeing the creation of the Eye of Isera, a space within the dream that allowed the Green Dragonflight to watch over both realms. The Green Aspect did not dare leave the delicate first blooms of her work unattended. Instead, she sent an apparition of herself to attend the meeting. Isera's vision looked like a ghostly version of the Green Aspect, one that glowed like a portal to the dream itself. It could speak and interact with the Aspects as Isera herself might, but Alexstrasza found herself missing her sister's quiet warmth and strength all the same. Far below the seat, Valdraken still slumbered, its skies quiet. A light breeze drifted to the tower, cool and gentle. It was a perfect morning for flying, though Alexstrasza's mood was anything but free. Can we take no action to stop Razageth? Alexstrasza said, frustration seeping into her tone. She has wrought only havoc for fifty years, and now she strikes so close to our home with reckless abandon. Harrow's Deep has sent our emissaries away, and I fear more strident actions will provoke them to violence. The incarnates know our talons are tied, Neltharion replied. We have no authority over Razageth, and we would be ill-advised to strike at Harrow's Deep. Yeah, it's true, they have them. If they're not going to... If they want to have the... Um basically like the plausible, not necessarily plausible deniability, but if they want to have like that, the aegis of being justified in all of their actions beyond a shadow of a doubt, then they could only be reactive instead of proactive when it comes to this war, um, for the most part, other than sort of like some subterfuge kind of stuff. So what do we do? Malago said. The Spellweaver usually looked so nonchalant, but today even his scales seemed rustled. Their next strike could be on the Obsidian Citadel, the Azure Archives, or even the Emerald Gardens. The vision of Ysera flared her nostrils in annoyance. I don't believe they would dare strike so boldly at us. It is one thing to burn a Terasek village, but quite another to engage the full strength of a dragonflight at the seat of its power. We cannot pretend that war is not an eventuality, not any more, Neltharion replied, nodding to Ysera. Even Nosdormu has said as much. I did not say war was an eventuality, Nosdormu replied, looking sideways at Neltharion. I said the pathways to peace grow fewer by the season, and that the probability of war was now higher than before. The more our council seeks conflict, the more likely we are to find it. Neltharion curled his lip. I do not seek war with the incarnates, knows Dormu. Perhaps not in this exact moment, the bronze aspect said, clearly unconvinced. That's enough, Alexstrasza said, but in the deep, dark recesses of her heart, she wondered if Neltharion would welcome war. No, no, she told herself, chasing away her unfounded thoughts. 
Alexstrasza couldn't cast such dispersions on one of her oldest and fiercest allies. Neltharion had never done anything to deserve her mistrust, nor had he been untruthful with her or the other aspects. Still, her concern shadowed her heart. Alexstrasza had no doubt that Eridicron had every intention of putting them between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. Diplomacy was failing her, but that was what war meant, was it not? The absolute and utter failure of diplomacy. She could no more compel the incarnates to peace talks than she could forbid the sun to rise. How could she reason with zealotry, with hatred? How could she soften a heart as hard as stone itself or melt the ice that now encased Viranoths? But most of all, how do we defend ourselves from the primalists without starting a war? Alexstrasza mused aloud. We cannot close our borders. Not every primal dragon is affiliated with Harrow's Deep, and pushing them out of our lands will only send them into our enemies' ranks. That is true, Eltharion began. However, so long as our lands remain accessible to everyone, we lose the strategic advantage. If we cannot close our borders, then we should move to banish all primal dragons from our seats of power. It's been centuries since Eridicron began this movement against us, Neltharion continued. By now he has likely mapped our holdings, numbered our ranks, and discovered our weak points. That is why primal dragons cannot approach the Obsidian Citadel from the west, nor are they allowed to fly over the Apex Canopy, or Lifebinder's Conservatory. And how have you enforced such an edict? Malagos asked. How else? With force, Neltharion said with a snort though I am certain the blue dragon flight could achieve similar results by magical means. The vision of Isera tilted her head. While I support this plan, it would be wise to make a statement reiterating that all peaceful primal dragons are welcome in the broodlands. I do not wish to further antagonize our primal kin. Titans know they are already harassed enough, those Dormu said with a sigh. I assume you've all heard the news concerning some of our drakes. What news? Alexstrasza asked. I've had recent reports that our youngest drakes are harassing the primal dragons who hunt in the broodlands, Nosdormu said. I intended to bring up the point at our next formal council meeting, but it seems relevant now. Alexstrasza sighed as a dull ache began to pound under her temple. And how long has that been happening? A flight leader caught a small pack of them fighting a primal dragon three moons ago. Nosdorma replied as Malagos rolled his eyes, but we believe the drakes have been at it for some time. Why do our young ones feel the need to attack primal dragons? The vision of Isera asked Nosdormu. The primal dragons have been taunting them, Nosdorma replied. It is no excuse. Alexstrasza turned to her major dormo, Sarastras, who sat at her right wing. Gather the drakes in question to the ruby enclave at sunset. I wish to address them myself. It shall be done, the majordomo replied. As he quit the seat with the other majordomos, Alexstrasza turned back to the aspects. Malagos spoke first. Neltharion makes a good point. We should consider keeping primal dragons away from our flight's bastions. While I cannot stop the incarnates from attacking our territories by magical means, I may be able to deter them. Alexstrasza lifted her head, curious. Go on. It would be best to show you, Malagos said, twisting a bit of arcane fire around his talons. Sparks fell to the ground, expanded, and swirled up into a miniature funnel. The air snapped with electricity as the energy began to coalesce, then settle. An elemental emerged from the vortex, crackling and glowing like a hunk of mana crystal. Two eyes burned like stars in its head. An arcane elemental? Meltharion asked, lifting a brow. Correct, Melago said. My flight has recently developed techniques to summon and command these beings. Forgive me, Malagos, the vision of Isera said, cocking her head to one side. I failed to see how we might employ these to our benefit. Ah, that's where the magic comes in, my dearest Isera, Malagos replied with a wave of his claws. The arcane elemental shimmered and transformed, glowing, growing blue scales, a tail, wings, and a crested neck and head. In seconds, a full-grown blue dragon stood before them, swishing its tail from side to side. Titans be good, is it real? Alexstrasza said, eyes widening. She strode forward, reaching out to touch the blue dragon. Her talons swept straight through empty air. 
The dragon elemental swung its head around to look at the life binder, but its eyes stared straight through her, lifeless. No, Malago said as Neltharion joined Alexstrasza. However, my flight could summon an army of arcane elementals and glamour them to look and act like dragons. Were we to place such simulacrums in strategic locations around the broodlands? We could make our forces appear to be three or four times larger than they are, Neltharion said, his eyes flashing with bright fire. He paced around the dragon elemental. We could have an illusory army which would allow us to redirect the primalist's attention away from weak points in our defenses. Precisely, Malago said with a nod. The elementals can be augmented to provide shielding and defenses of strategic locations, or if you prefer, defenseless mortal and Tarasek villages. Alexstrasza shifted her gaze to the Spellweaver. How much of a strain would that place on your flight? A considerable one, but well worth the price, Malagos replied. We would need to have a blue or two in each location to shepherd the elementals, but drakes or even draconid may suffice. Very well, the Lifebinder said. Are there any objections to this plan, or are we of one mind? Does Dormu, what say you? It is a sound strategy, the Bronstra aspect said, though I would caution you to implement it slowly, so that hundreds of dragons don't appear along our borders overnight. I agree, Neltharion said. With your leave, Alexstrasza, I will work with Malagos to select the initial locations for our new troops. Good, the Lifebinder said, turning to Isera's vision last. And what of you, sister? Is there anything we have overlooked? The vision of Isera closed her eyes and hummed in thought. Only this. I want to extend a wing of protection to the mortal villages with whom we have worked hard to build relations. I do not want the Storm Eater to undo decades of hard work. But of course, Malago said. Will you send your ambassadors and their visages to introduce the mortals to the elementals? Both the red and green flights have demonstrated a remarkable ability to understand and assist them. With pleasure, Ysera's vision bobbed her head. It is decided then, Alexstrasza said. Let us be about our work. That evening the Broodland's young drakes gathered at the Ruby Enclave. Alexstrasza was fond of the stone pavilion in the Enclave, the one that stood on the cliff's edge. Its arches faced northwest, allowing her to watch over the ruby life pools. Flowering vines twisted up the structure's columns, filling the air with their sweet scent. Enchanted flames danced in opalescent sconces. A small waterfall tumbled from the mountain's heights nearby, cooling the air around her. While the pavilion lacked the grandeur of the seat of the aspects, it was an ideal setting for addressing a group of wayward youths. More intimate, less imposing, these drakes were among the first generations of dragons to be born to ordered parents, and she was keen to ensure they flew straight and true. Alexstrasza stood at the top of the pavilion steps as the drakes arrived, flanked by her consort, Tyrannostraza, and her major domo, Sarastraz. The sunset light flashed off the drakes' red, black, bronze, green, and blue scales. Most were still in their adolescence. Most of them had seen fewer than a hundred summers, a fraction of Alexstrasza's own years. They were so young knew so little about their world. The Lifebinder could sense the drake's nervousness. They shifted their weight and shook out their wings, casting anxious glances toward the pavilion. As Sarah Straws announced Alex Straws, the young ones bowed to her, the gesture awkward and unpracticed. Whispers rippled through the assembly. Greetings, my young ones, Alex Straws said, sitting atop the pavilion stairs. How my heart soars at the sight of you. When I look upon your young faces, I have nothing but faith in the future of our flights. Alexstrasza swept her gaze over the enclave. However, I have heard disquieting news of late. I am told that you have instigated fights with primal dragons, both within and outside our borders. I cannot fathom what would drive you to such a thing. For centuries we have endeavored to make peace with our primal kin, yet your behavior only serves to divide us. More than half of the assembled drakes dropped their gazes to the ground. The Lifebinder paused for a moment, giving them time to consider her words. Our charge is not to take life, but to protect it. These were the oaths we made to the world as the dragon flights first came to be. It is my duty to ensure our flights uphold the oaths we made, which is why I cannot condone your actions. We did not choose this life, a voice said from the back, interrupting her. We took no oaths. 
We make no promises. Gasps echoed through the enclave. Sarah Straz stepped forward, but Alex Straza held up two talons, preferring to handle the situation herself. I would say that I am surprised by your audacity, Alex Straza said with a chuckle. But I suppose it is your audacity that brought us here this evening. Step forward, young one, so that we may speak face to face. The drakes turned their heads, then parted, allowing a young red to step to the front of the crowd. He stood of average height and wingspan for his age, but his movements were lithe and graceful. Two long, elegant horns curved off the top of his head. But Alex Straza thought the most remarkable thing about him was his utter lack of fear. He stood before an aspect, yet he held his head high while his fellows cowered. Talon Straz, Alex Straza said, recognizing the brazenness in him, the fearlessness. The young Red's eyes widened when he realized the life binder knew his name. He should not have been surprised, for she knew the name of every dragon hatched and tended at the ruby life pools. Judging by his relative age, he had been a whelp there some years ago, not quite among one of the first generations of successfully ordered eggs, but not long after, either. She tilted her head, scrutinizing the drake. When you say you did not choose this life, what do you mean? Talonstraws lifted his head, holding the red's aspect's gaze. We are taught that in the days before Valdraken, every dragon was allowed to choose whether they wished to be ordered. But I was given no such choice. I remember being infused with order magic while I was still in my egg. I have dreams about it, as does Siragosa. Talonstraws nodded to a blue drake who stood to Alexstrasza's left, just on the cusp of the crowd. It wasn't unusual for a dragon to be aware of their surroundings before they hatched, particularly as their time grew close. The egg tenders told Alex Straza that many of their whelps claimed to remember being infused with light and warmth and comfort, but Alex Straza failed to see why such a memory would cause these drakes to question their ordering. Curious, Alex Straza turned to the blue drake. And what do you remember, Siragosa? Siragosa sat on the ground and wrapped her tail around her feet. Unlike Talon Straz, she did not meet and hold the lifeguinder's gaze. Perhaps remember isn't quite the word. Malagos tells us to always be precise with our language, and to say that I remember being ordered isn't truthful. When I sleep, sometimes I think I can still feel magic sliding across my scales, changing them from one thing to another. Perhaps it is more dream than memory? I cannot know. Scales flashed as several of the drakes nodded in agreement. You all dream of this? Alex Straza asked the assembly. More nods, a chorus of, yes, my queen, rose from their lips, some voices loud, others no more than a whisper. It is not surprising that you remember being ordered, Alexstrasza said. We as aspects have always allowed parents to bring their eggs to the broodlands to be infused with aura magic. I suppose it may also be possible that your mothers were with clutch on the day of their ordering, as we place no restrictions on such things. However, she continued, I fail to see how this issue intersects with the unsanctioned attacks on primal drakes. Talonstra stepped forward. The primal dragons taunt us, my queen. They call us abominations, soft scales who live only to serve the titan's whims. We try to ignore them, and sometimes we fight with them, but lately I cannot help but wonder if they have the right of it. Previous generations of order drakes had never voiced such before. And if they do, then we did not choose this life, Talonstraz said, his tone shifting, breath fluttering faster. None of us did. Alexstrasza exchanged a glance with Tyrannostraz. Primal dragons taunting order drakes, planting incendiary ideas in their minds. It sounded very much like something a Ritochron would do. How many of the stone scaled's agents roosted in the broodlands, waiting for a chance to spent, spread their vile poison among the dragonflight's ranks? The notion only strengthened her, her, strengthened her desire to expel the primal dragons from the dragonflight's individual seats of power. What would happen if the unaffiliated dragons in the wilds heard these rumblings, if Viranoth heard them? Why, it could cause untold chaos. To counter his rising temper, Alexstrasza exuded an aura of patience and serenity, hoping to reach the little red's heart. Talon Straz, you were born to the red dragonflight, which means the magic in your veins grants you great wisdom, courage, and compassion. She said gently, you must see that answering the primal dragon's resentment with violence is folly. They are too short-sighted to see the gifts that order magic bestows upon our kind. Why should I allow them to berate me for a choice that was not my own? Talonstraz said. 
Our red historians have said that every dragon was allowed to choose for themselves. Why were we denied this opportunity? Eggs born from ordered parents are ordered themselves, Alexstrasza said gently. It is for your parents to explain why they made this choice for themselves and for their bloodline. I don't know who my parents are, Talonstrad said, raising his voice. I understand the red flight allows parents to choose their involvement with the brood. I understand how this helps to empower our flights. But I have not been claimed by any among our number, nor have many of the drakes here. Those who know their ordered parents may find these answers, but I cannot. For most every drake who stands here today, Talonstrad, Sarah Strauss said sharply, mind your tone when you are speaking to the queen. He is not wrong, one of the black drakes cried. We should have been given the right to choose, said a green. Siragosa tilted her head, however, and said, That isn't entirely correct, Talon. Several drakes here have memories of being ordered, and yet they know the faces of their parents. My aspect always says that memory is malleable, which is why we write things down. Your so-called memories may not be what you believe them to be. What about... What the bronze saw, a blue drake said. Oh, please, Siragosa said, rolling her eyes and tossing her head. Nolis Dormu cannot see what he hunted last week in the timeways, much less what happened to him before his hatching day. Hey, that's not true, a bronze said with a sniff. Voices began to burble and snap, tensions rising. Alexstrasza lifted her right wing, commanding the attention of the room. The drakes fell silent, but Alexstrasza could sense how Talonstrasza's words had ruffled their scales. Do you see how the primal Drake's words divide us? She said softly, but her tone was deadly. As we speak, Eridicron and his primalists do everything in their power to destroy our flights. They will tell any lie, exploit any weakness, and murder innocents in pursuit of their goals. I have no doubt that Eridicron now seeks to turn your hearts against your home, your families, and your flights. You may not yet know your parents' talent straws, and so long as it is their right to keep such knowledge, you may never know them. But the Red Flight protects you, guides you, uplifts you in their stead. The Primalists would have you isolated from your flight, weak without our support, easy prey. We must all guard against the Stone Scales' lies, Alexstrasza continued. Though I empathize with your concerns, I ask you come to me directly for an audience and not entertain idle gossip and wild speculation. I would also counsel you to be cautious in your dealings with primal drakes, for many will not have your best interests at heart. Do you understand? Most of the drakes bowed their heads in assent. Talon Strauss held the life guinder's gaze, and for a heartbeat, Alex Strauss had thought the drake would be foolish enough to challenge her a second time, but he too closed his eyes and lowered his head. As your queen, I forbid you from fighting with the primal dragons unless lives are at stake, Alexstrasza said. And as she spoke, one of her red scribes seared the words on a parchment, binding them into law. For your indiscretions, each of you shall serve for a season at Wormrest Temple, where you will assist our ambassadors with outreach efforts. Perhaps then you will understand the gifts you have been given. The drakes groaned, but their voices rose in a chorus of, Yes, my queen. Now go, she said with a patient smile. Venture forth and be paragons of your flights. A bright future lies ahead for each one of you. With the pronouncement made, Sarah Strauss stepped away to usher the drakes out of the enclave. The lifebinder watched them go, mulling over their words. As the young drakes took wing, filling the skies with brilliant bursts of color, Tarana Strauss nudged her shoulder, then gestured for her to join him at the edge of the pavilion. Alex Strauss sank down beside her consort with a sigh. In the distance, the sunset gilded the spires of the ruby life pools. The vista, though striking, brought her no peace. I knew it would be difficult to be queen, Alexstrasza said as the drake's silhouette shrank into the sky. But I feel as though I am failing everyone. The flights, the other aspects. Tear. In moments like this, she wished Keeper Tear was still here to guide her. While she may not always have agreed with his methods, his results spoke for themselves. You are not failing anyone, Alex Straza, Tarana Straza said, lifting his head to look at the horizon. We knew the skies before us were full of strong headwinds. While the charge to collect eggs from the wilds might be controversial to some, 
None of us choose the circumstances of our birth. The vast majority of drakes hatched from adopted eggs have been a credit to their flights. Still, I can't help but worry, Alexstrasza replied. The primalist threat grows by the day, Nelfarian, who has ever been one of my closest allies, works in the shadows and tells me little of his activities. Members of a rising generation seek to reject the very essence of their being, and perhaps they are right to be angry. Though she didn't speak Virenoth's name aloud, Alexstrasza's thoughts turned to her oldest friend, too. The Lifebinder had been careful to keep this secret through all the long years, hoping it would never reach Virenoth's ears. Some trusted members of her flight knew, of course, because how could they not? They were responsible for accepting, ordering, and caring for the eggs, after all. The old worm chuckled, nuzzling Alexstrasza's snout. Such is the folly of youth, my love. In time, they will see the great gift you have bestowed upon them. This is a grand experiment you have undertaken, and none could have embodied the position with as much vigor and wisdom as you. You are kind to me, Alexstrasza said, casting her gaze over the broodlands. In the distance, the drakes wheeled and dived through the skies, thinking themselves free of Alexstrasza's watchful gaze. I do not regret the decision we made as aspects all those years ago. Just look at them. So full of potential and possibility, granted abilities that do not even exist in the philosophies of our primal cousins. And yet... In the quiet moments, Alexstrasza wondered if she had made a mistake. She had only expressed this fear once, long ago, and only to her sister. Since then, she had grown into her role as queen and realized there was some burden she would need to shoulder alone. Do not fear, Tyrannostras said. Ever have I watched you rise to meet your challenges with courage and compassion. This time will be no different. She smiled very much, wanting to believe him. Yeah, it's nice to hear um, when people close to you, when people that are qualified to make judgment, criticism on your character, on your actions, on your ethic, on your work, um, <clears throat> to have faith and confidence and uh, compliments, sure, but acknowledgement, specific targeted acknowledgement of what you do, that feels good. But it's definitely, uh, I understand the um, that concept of, of self-doubt um, in leadership, in, um, that's, you know, my role. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the, I'm, I'm high up in my organization. And, and I understand that, um, I get that. You have to, you, pro you project, just like she said, some burdens you have to shoulder alone. You project, you have to project um, calmness and uh, confidence and build relationships and listen, even though I go home every day and just wrap myself, replay the mistakes. It's like the losses. It's You heard this in like press conferences in football too. The losses are 10 times more memorable and painful than the wins. The mistakes I make each day weigh on me so much more than those shiny moments. And it's a bad way to live. And, and I think you have to strike a balance. And and I I, I, I have no answers. I, I struggle with it all the time, too. Um, and I think that's true in relationships, too. The slights that you make to the people you love, to your friends, to your partners. Um, they do so much more damage than the times when you lift someone up um you know you can be i can my wife can come home from work and have a hard day and i can support her 99 times out of 100 but if on that hundredth time she catches me when i'm not at my strongest and i you know and i curtly say well maybe these problems are on you you know maybe you play a role um it's not well received <laughs> and i can undo the other 99 days in one one sweep all right, so that was, um, I don't know, I feel middling about that because they're frustrating. Um, it's frustrating to see these two sides and not to get political, but it makes me think of, um, not to necessarily associate like conservative uh, politics with the, the aspects and, and um, 
left leaning politics with the primals. I mean, with the with the other way around. Either way, not to not to, get, to conflate them, but to when you have two sides that are um, like so that butt so heads and are so philosophically different. You uh, there's a show called Newsroom. I think I watched, and there's a guy who's a reporter, the main character, and he is a, a conservative. Um, but he's constantly giving his own party a hard time trying to call him the task. And so someone calls him out and says, you are just like, you're not really a conservative. You just give yourself that brand so that you can really be, um, a liberal and <clears throat> come hard at this other side. And he goes, no, the, the, I, I offer those criticisms about this, this other party because I care about them. And if the liberal side is is so good, then how come they lose so effing much? <laughs> and I feel like that I'm you get that vibe. Yeah, if the ordered dragons are so good, how come they lose so effing much? You know, how do they get themselves? How does the side of good just constantly it you know um, put themselves in a bad situation? I watched. I was reading something else the other day too. Sorry to get on such a, a tangent, but this. is... Sometimes these books spark these thoughts in me. You know, you have a long day at work, you have life. There's another book I was reading the other day or something. I can't remember where I came across this. Maybe it was a show. I can't remember. But the... <clears throat> oh, it was a book. I was reading um, one of the Dritz de Worden books. And he often waxes philosophical in his book. But one of the characters in the book was saying, a lot of the times leaders are given credit for... Um, being stronger or smarter or more effective because what they actually have is a complete lack of scruples. They're willing to do things that the other side is not willing to do. And that can be very effective. Um, so if you're willing to completely sacrifice your ethics and your morality, you can get a lot of crap done. Uh, that's not what I, I can never walk that path. But I think that's what you see in a lot of shows, movies, literature, video games in this book in this book and in, in the world warcraft the bad the side of evil the the side that's bad is so effective because they're willing to do anything um yeah all right so um we have another episode in the pipe five by five and i appreciate you for watching for listening even when i ramble and i'll see everybody next time on another episode of Lore of Warcraft.